All right, so we continue with financial institutions, and we have thrifts. Uh, this is the topic, thrifts or thrift operations. So first let's clarify some general terminology because it's generally quite uh, confusing. Well, let's now use the, 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 the red one. Is that there are two types of thrifts. So first of all, they're called thrifts. And thrift is the same as savings institutions. savings institutions. Now, thrifts and savings institutions have two different types of institutions within this category. And one is called savings, savings associations. So, one is Savings Associations, and the other one is called Savings Banks. Uh, savings Associations, in turn, are known as SNLs. Savings and Loan Associations. So, you have to make a distinction between savings institutions, which is a group of two, and savings associations, which is a financial institution, a type of financial institution. Now, I don't know this clear definition and difference, but distinction between these two of them, but the general definition is that they accept deposits and make mortgage loans, accept deposits and make mortgage loans. So that's the what general. About, what about credit union? Credit union is coming the next chapter. We'll do that too. In a credit uh, union, uh, let, let's, not, let's not complicate credit unions, uh, uh, etc. Uh, so it's not threat? Yeah. It's not threat? No, not really. They, they kind of have them as a separate institution, separate type of financial institution or credit union. So let's focus on this one and then we'll make distinctions on the way. Alright, so the first key characteristic is charter. And the charter can be uh, federal or it could be state. Some prefer to be federally chartered, others prefer to be state chartered. This is not as important for uh, what we're doing. The second characteristic is a little bit more important, ownership. And the ownership comes in two types. The first one is called mutual. And the second one is, let's see how they call it, stock, how they call it, stock owned, stock owned. Uh -oh. Alright, mutual has, is a general legal term. Yeah, no problem. Mutual is a general legal term, which means, what is it? Uh, let's see what we have now. We have the concept of so-called mutual mutual to stock conversion which essential essentially a mutual will convert to a stock on first of all what is the difference the difference of mutual is that it is owned by its depositors essentially the depositors are technically and legally share owners and there are no real shares. Now with a stock owned, it is the, on the other hand, you actually have real shares and real shares allow for raising capital and allow for mergers and acquisitions. So when there was a trend in mergers, acquisitions, etc., you actually uh, need uh, stock owned and mutual to stock conversion usually allows uh, this uh, to, to happen. 
So this is usually done, done in so-called takeovers. So takeover is a process where one company acquires yeah. another company or acquires a controlling package. Uh, mergers and acquisitions. Yeah, mergers and acquisitions. Uh, but takeover is when one company acquires another as opposed to a merger. Merger is more like merger of two vehicles. A and B merge uh, together as opposed to A acquires or devours uh, B. Okay. All right, so. Uh, and the key to, to stock owned is that stock owned are also susceptible to what is known as hostile takeover. Hostile takeover, let's write it out. Uh, you should hostile takeover. Something you should be familiar from corporate finance is when one company wants to acquire another company without the other company being willing to be acquired. So, you, you know, a company A acquires B even though B does not like the idea of being acquired. Well, why is that? Typically because B is poorly run, management is bad, and if someone can take over and run it better, they will make a lot more profits. Well, what does it mean uh, that B is poorly run and someone can run it better? It means that you throw out your old management and your old management doesn't like the idea of running poorly a business and getting good salaries and losing their jobs. So usually they will not want to be acquired. So sometimes you can get a hostile takeover. When there is a threat of hostile takeover, it puts management uh, into a defensive position where they will usually perform a little bit better. In other words, a hostile takeover represents a market's way to control uh, management when management is inefficient. As long as the market perceives that management is uh, inefficient. All right. You also have what is known as, so this is the first type, it's called a, a merger conversion. Merger conversion. All right, so, so when a uh, merger, so when an SNL is involved in a merger, it will first convert, it will first convert to stock owned and then it will execute whatever the transaction is with and through the stocks. Okay, let's see what else we have. Oh, we have now uh, the concept of savings banks where they provide minimal distinction. Alright, so savings banks, let's see, they can be, again, state chartered or federally chartered, they could be, again, mutual or stock owned, no big difference. Uh, Alright, let's see, there are minor differences, there are minor differences, let me try to cl clarify them, they're not big. Uh, uh, savings banks are mostly, mostly in North Eastern states, northeastern states, for some historical reasons of long time ago, uh, and they're not heavily concentrated, not concentrated on mortgages. and provide more diversified by services to customers. So you can take a loan to buy a car or furniture? Possibly, possibly. Uh, well, well, diversified services, that doesn't mean necessarily diversified loan products. It may mean checking, it may mean other things, payments, etc. So it doesn't have to be. Uh, Alright, uh, let's see. 
Well, that's pretty much it. No big difference. No big difference. I was never, never able to figure out a essential, essential difference. It's mostly uh, superficial differences. All right. So the next is what we typically do, which is uh, sec second part, and that is sources of funds. Sources of funds, if you remember, we said last time, well, usually means liabilities. So, how do they raise funds? First and foremost is deposits for the simple reason that they are depository institutions and accept deposits. They got savings deposits, they got time deposits, uh, let's see, they have passbook deposits. They also have retail CD. Very, very important is a retail. Professor, what do they sometimes call chairs? The source of funds? Chair? Chairs. Chair. Chairs. Oh, chairs. shares. Oh, sources of funds are shares because uh, if it's a mutual, if it's a mutual, when you deposit in the fund your money, you're essentially not making a classic type deposit. You become a share owner, part owner. So with a mutual, the structure is not that of a legal deposit. The structure that is you become part owner or share owner. So that's the reason why it is called a share. So share is differentiated from stock uh, in the sense of stock is a stock market, stock the way you study it in corporate finance, which can be bought, sold, traded on secondary markets, uh, etc. All right, so this is the basic uh, difference between share and stock in this sense. All right, mm -hmm. share in this sense and stock in the way that you usually study. All right, and money market deposit accounts. So, money market deposit accounts. Are you also zooming in, right? All right, so let's see what else we have. Uh, later on, they added now accounts. Now accounts. I think we mentioned it last time, right? Now accounts. Now account. So this is negotiable order of withdrawal account. Uh, it is a new type. I don't want to get into it because it's not very, very popular. All right, let's see what else we have. And the, the final thing is, at one point, it provided limited checking. Limited checking account. So these are some of the things. The second uh, they used is, of course, borrowed. So they use borrowed, let's call them funds. So who do they borrow from? Number one is they borrow or lend, if they have surplus, to the Fed funds. The second that they do is uh, to the Fed's discount window. So discount loans. In other words, borrowing from the Fed. So what you see is that most of these elements repeat themselves over and over, so they don't need, again, the, the full. And, and, and the final way that they usually finance themselves is through repos. repos. All right. And the third one, of course, is... Long-term. Well, no, capital. There, there isn't much of a long term. Capital is long term, but they don't have long term because they don't have this classic type borrowing which commercial banks have. If it's a mutual, they usually use these borrowed funds mostly to manage liquidity mostly to manage short-term liquidity when it comes to withdrawals and when it comes to managing uh, minimum required reserves. All right? So they use mostly capital and they use mostly deposits. 
All right, so uh, they will use for capital what is known uh, from accounting, you should be perfectly familiar, as retained earnings. earnings. So retained earnings essentially are profits which have not been distributed as back as, as to the owners as dividends and have been what they call plowed back or reinvested in the business. So they usually capitalize, they convert the retained earnings into capital and they use it as uh, capital and if and when they issue stocks if and when they issue stocks. So sometimes they may have uh, long-term liquidity problems. When they have a long-term liquidity problem, usually because it's a mutual, borrowing is a little tricky, so the best way to do is you simply issue shares. And when you issue shares, you raise Cash. cash. You raise yes. cash, which uh, represents long-term capital. So the liability structure is extremely simple and the simplicity comes because you have some capital which is typical, it is a depository institution and this is a small just for the purposes of liquidity, liquidity management, alright? So these represent the uh, sources of funds, so now let's look, once they get the money, what do they Uses of funds. Now, with it. So we move on to uses of funds. All right, so uses of funds. Uh, six primary uses. Let's do uses. Let's list them and we take a break. Number one is cash. cash, which they usually have. Number two is mortgages, which is like their primary investment. Of course, mortgages are not an investment, but that's how it's counted. The third one is mortgage backed securities. Mm -hmm. Number four is other securities. What is number five? Consumer and commercial loans. Securities. So number five is, uh, let's, let's put it this way, loans. Consumer and? Commercial. Commercial and six. What is six? Other uses. Some other uses. Okay. Other. All right. Cash first and foremost for reserves. That one is fairly straightforward. Yeah. Second, they use mostly for uh, withdrawals. In other words, for Redemption. The redemptions, right, from last time. And the third thing, they use cash in correspondent banks. So, usually a mutual fund will, sorry, mutual fund, uh, uh, a savings bank, Thrift will maintain an account with other financial institution, uh, usually a commercial bank, and we call the bank correspondent bank, and the account is correspondent cash account and they use it for other transactions, check writing and whatnot. So they will use the services of other commercial bank and if you're gonna use their services, you're gonna maintain some cash balance there, all right? So that's uh, another typical uh, use. Second is mortgages. This is primary, this is the big one. Very early on, they were mostly focused on residential. Residential because the origins of savings and loans from 100 years before that in the late 1800s 
were uh, mostly residential. The idea of a savings and loan was that of a credit union, which will finance mostly housing. Savings and loans back then were called <coughs> building and loans, building and loan association. So essentially, the loan was a construction loan uh, made to the future owner, which will be long term. And the idea was social. The idea was let's build a community where 1,000 people, we're helping each other so that everybody gets a house. And from there, the original idea of people helping each other got perverted into make more money. Let's get into commercial real estate. Let's start making consumer loans for non real estate purposes, commercial loans for non-real estate purposes. So the original uh, idea uh, was diluted over time and forgotten into the idea of make more money, all right? Well, sometimes for managers it will mean more power, all right? You mean the word residential doesn't mean the same, the same word as we use it now? Yeah, no, that's what it means. Like residential means Perhaps. houses where people will live. Yes, this is what the idea was. The idea of, uh, uh, of this was to allow people to have their own home. This was the original idea was for home. Well, now it's also for commercial purposes and whatnot. Right now, it also has a completely different idea, which is political idea where politicians are trying to uh, conduct monetary, well, back then, monetary policy by stimulating mortgages and real estate construction, all right? So they, what's called, juice up the economy. They tried to boost the economy by boosting SNL activity. So usually when SNL activity starts overheating, usually politicians ignore it, just like politicians ignored the recent real estate bubble because, you know, people were warned, hey, things are terrible, things are going to go a crisis, but, you know, everyone was keeping quiet because for political reasons, this was keeping the economy going or growing real fast. So usually politicians like to use it for those uh, purposes. All right. Now, mortgages in general, uh, everything has uh, interest rate risk, and I will be talking a lot more about interest rate risk uh, later. And there is also so-called credit credit risk. All right, so they have interest rate risk and credit risk. I'll be explaining uh, later uh, about now. Now the next one is mortgage-backed securities. So usually they will be getting themselves or buying the mortgages themselves and investing in the mortgage that someone else originated or alternatively they will be buying a packaged pool of mortgages and these packaged pools were known as, let's uh, clarify this, is pass-through. A pass-through simply means that you pull, I'm just providing as an example, 1,000 mortgages, you put them all together, you pull them all together, and these thousand work as one unit. So when you invest in them, you invest maybe in 1% of them, or 2%, or 50%, or you buy the, the full pool, and pass-through simply means that whatever income comes, there is no seniority. You get your share minus the servicing fees and servicing costs. So over here you also have servicing fees and servicing costs. This is the other side is called the other side is called securitization. And in a securitization, you first pool all securities and then you provide tranches. Senior tranche which gets the money first, 
then the middle trench, which is called uh, uh, mezzanine trench, which gets the uh, cash flow second, and then you have the lowest trench, which is called the uh, equity tranche or trench. You know, both of them are used. And first, the cash flow flows to the senior, that's why it's considered the lowest risk. Then it goes to the mezzanine, which is considered a little bit higher risk. And whatever cash flow is left for the equity tranche, it goes to the equity tranche. So the equity tranche is very high risk. The idea is that uh, what you do is you, rather than distribute equally the risk amongst the, the, the complete pool, you concentrate the risk in that 1% or 2% of mortgages. You make first concentration of risk. And if the risk spreads, it doesn't spread equally. It spreads next to the second tranche, to the third tranche, etc. So you, what you do, you expose or overexpose the lower tranches and try to shield the higher tranches from risk. And this way, this is essentially the tranching is slicing it. All right, so this is the process of securitization. Over here, there are no trenches. It's one huge trench or it's just one big pool and they invest in those. Let's see what else we have here. All right, so what are other securities? Treasury bills, treasury notes, treasury bonds. Uh, they will also use some corporate bonds. They will use these for liquidity purposes or liquidity management. In other words, they'd be investing in highly liquid securities, mostly not for the earnings themselves, but for the ability to sell them quickly when liquidity is needed, usually for redemption. And the other thing that they got in self, I will be explaining a little bit more a little later, is junk bonds. Junk bonds. All right, I'll be explaining about this a little uh, later. All right, the next one is uh, consumer loans, commercial loans. Essentially, during 1918, later on in 1982, because SNLs got into deep trouble because interest rates were rising. 70s were times of rising interest rate environment and SNLs were heavily exposed to interest rate risk. So usually as a result of the high interest rate risk which they were exposed and they were suffering big losses, they needed other businesses to expand. In other words, these were institutions that ran on a classic pyramid scheme. It was a pyramid scheme where they needed more inflows in order to keep things going and as interest rates rose, as interest rates rose, I'll be explaining more about it, they needed two things. They needed to expand, which in modern days we we'll call it now balloon their balance sheet. So they needed to expand their balance sheet, so they needed other areas of lending. That was number one. And uh, number two, they had to raise interest rates on their deposits, which, uh, uh, which resulted, well, let's write it over here. Let's write it over here. In so-called rate wars, this is exactly what we are facing, Bulgaria has been facing over the last six months, where each financial institution is declaring a war on the others by offering higher interest rates in order to attract deposits. Well, but offering higher interest rates, why do they do that? Well, the answer is they have fixed uh, return on their assets. So they got 10, 20 year mortgages and they're making, let's say, 10%. Originally, the deposit cost them 5% and 6% and 8% and as interest rates rise, people move from one financial institution to another financial institution. I was explaining last time, if you remember last time, that uh, money market mutual funds became 
very hot during the late 90s, sorry, 70s, because the interest rate environments were rising. They could pay very high interest rates, and once they allow checking and whatnot, suddenly savings SNLs and commercial banks began bleeding funds. Well, when these guys are bleeding, the only thing that they can do is raise interest rates. But here's the thing. Once interest rates goes beyond the return on assets, so they're getting 10% fixed interest, but they're paying 12%, and because they're losing money and they're losing liquidity, and they're, you know, they got to raise to 13. But when you raise to 13, you lose even more. So you sink deeper and deeper. Well, this is the nature of a pyramid scheme when you're offering even more money, you're losing even more, but at least temporarily you attract deposits from competitors. And usually this type of, uh, this type of interest rate uh, or let's call it business behavior usually ends up in a disaster. Yeah, no, well, yeah, rate wars usually result in huge losses for all financial institutions and usually insolvency, bailouts, uh, etc. All right, so consumer loans and whatnot. So at that point, in order to bloat or to be able to balloon their balance sheet, the, there came in 1980 and later on in 1982 a deregulation which allowed them to expand in other businesses. So once they were able to expand into loans, consumer commercial loans, suddenly the difference between SNLs and commercial banks began to blur. There wasn't any. They got check writing capabilities, they got commercial loans, so suddenly what's the difference? Well, not much of a difference. One of, the other, uh, one of the other differences that disappeared is that they had a separate regulator which turned out to be totally corrupt and incompetent. So they were moved to FDIC as a regulator. So suddenly there was little difference of an SNL from a commercial bank except possibly, well it's already deleted, the mutual structure versus the classic corporate structure. Well, the corporate structure provided certain benefits, clear benefits, uh, being able to raise funds, etc., etc. And many of the SNL, through the conversion which I described, mutual to stock conversion, also converted and became more like commercial banks. So that is one of the many reasons why they have grown less of an importance, simply because they've grown to become effectively commercial banks. I have a question regarding, you said the rate of the wars, isn't like there's a regulation on the commercial banks that they can't... Okay, well, that's uh, what I'm going to be getting later. Yes, this is what the regulation came in the late 60s all the way to the uh, so late the 70s. Was to, to stop the rate wars. Yes, the regulation, the idea was to stop the rate wars, correct. But if the market wants to raise interest rate, it will find its way. So one of the ways to find is, well, I already deleted it, retail CDs, which I'll be explaining later as contributing to the crisis. So suddenly they began to offer these retail CDs and yeah, you might not be able to offer the regular rate on the deposit regular, but you offer a retail CD and they raise interest rate on the retail CD. So yes, that's what the Fed tried to do. And by trying to limit the interest rate, it only exacerbated a bad problem because both commercial banks and thrifts were bleeding and they were bleeding to money market mutual funds. So money market mutual funds were prospering due to a poor regulation by, by the Fed or, or not well thought, in other words, the so-called unintended consequences. All right, uh, let's see what next. All right, commercial and whatnot. And uh, again, other uses will be uh, Fed funds. And remember, Fed funds shows up on the asset side and it shows up on the liability side. It is identical to commercial banks. Uh, Fed funds purchased 
fat funds sold. You usually don't have uh, fat funds at the same time, at the same time on the asset side and the liability because they will cancel each other, right? The, the, you don't have it. In other words, two or three days you have fat funds on the one side, the next five days on the other side. All right, so that's how it usually works. So at the end of the month, you usually have Fed funds only on the one side of the balance sheet. And, and the other one is fairly straightforward, is uh, repos. Repos is similar, if not identical. Again, repos is used to raise funds, and repo is used to lend uh, extra funds. So repos will be showing sometimes on the one side, sometimes on the other side, depending on what we call in banking and finance uh, liquidity, liquidity position. So liquidity position is available liquidity minus the necessary or the required operating liquidity. So, liquidity position have a little bit of a surplus. You're going to have these on the asset side and if you have a little bit of a deficiency, you will have it on the liability. You'll borrow a little bit extra to make it up. So, you have a certain liquidity which is a target liquidity that you have to have. If a little bit more, you lend it out and it remains on the asset side. If you have a little bit less, you borrow it to make up so it shows up on the liability. And ideally, it should, these two ideally should be fluctuating for a very short period of time on the left and on the right, on the left and on the right. If they constantly keep it on the right side, meaning on the liability side, this simply means that they're using short-term borrowing to fund apparently long-term needs. So in that case, if you get to maintain for too long on the liability side, the correct decision is to identify some sort of long-term lending or sell out an asset to solve the, the, this problem. In other words, if it shows up surfaces for too long on the one side, this means that you didn't manage well your liquidity, so you either got to extra borrow some money or pay down some debt or sell out some assets, whatever will be the transaction with a longer term asset or liability to bring the liquidity position to uh, what we call uh, neutral. Neutral. So, neutral simply means that some of the times on the one side, some of the times on the other side, but there is no preponderance of the one over the other. All right, let's do the next thing, which is regulation, and uh, I'm not going to get deep into regulation, but there is one important piece uh, which I. Uh, would like to cover. This is known as the so-called rating system. So regulators rate financial institutions and the modern rating is called, let's use red, right? Uh, it's called CAMEL, the CAMEL approach. So a CAMEL approach has been found to be the standard approach which is built into the law, into the law, where regulators have to go through this particular uh, procedure to evaluate the stability of commercial banks, other depositor institutions, and in general financial institutions. So the Camel approach is first is called capital adequacy. So it's capital. Adequacy, and which is something which I discussed on commercial banking, banking I don't know, five, uh, six videos ago. This is the ratio of capital relative to assets at risk. You have weighting of the assets, you have tier one capital, tier two capital. I don't want to get into that, but financial institutions should have sufficient capital. Usually, uh, usually financial institutions get in trouble for two reasons. They, have, they don't have enough liquidity, so get into liquidity problems. 
and they don't have enough capital, which results in an insolvency. So, a capital uh, adequacy, if you don't have enough capital adequacy, usually when capital, you know, little minor swings turn capital into negative and the financial institution becomes in solvent. And if you don't have uh, enough liquidity, it's called a bankrupt, right? Yes, bankrupt, yes. Uh, but, but bankrupt technically means different. Bankrupt is, or bankruptcy, is the procedure where you file with the court, where creditor files with the court to make his claim, all right? But insolvency, and we just call it illiquidity, illiquidity. All right, so the, the next thing is asset composition. Asset composition is associated, are you buying too many junk bonds? Are you lending to one particular, uh, let's say, industry too much? So, asset composition is associated with two intimately related things. Number one is diversification. And what's the other one? You told me you were studying portfolio theory, did you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we call it risk. Right? So, uh, asset composition is associated, are they reasonably diversified and are they assuming undue risk or too much risk? So, you look at it, you want to see a little bit of a lot of things and not too much concentration into one particular thing. Alright, so that's the second piece. The third piece is called management. Is management qualified? Is management, uh, let's write this down, uh, competent? One of the key characteristics is a financial industry. Once you have a wild and crazy boom like you have now in Saudi Arabia, like we had over the last 10 years in Bulgaria, or you had uh, at that time in the US, Financial industry grows too fast for the education industry to supply sufficiently competent experts. So, what you have in Bulgaria is that people with English philology become bankers. You have historians become bankers. You have engineers become bankers. In other words, you have people from all sorts of industries getting attracted by the financial industry. Usually, over time, uh, they get to grow. Uh, in Bulgaria, very, very interesting is uh, we had, you know, in a commercial bank, that lady that became the CEO of the commercial bank, which was legendary for that she started 15 years ago as a cashier with no education and move that from cashier to this position to next position to third position to fourth position to fifth position so slowly but steadily she was growing up well that's good and great for women that's good and great for career opportunities but in the end do you want to be run by uh, you know a lady who started as a cashier 15 years ago yeah well she has the experience but that's where the problem is Problem is, if you're going to be running a financial institution, experience is not enough. Experience is insufficient. You need a lot of knowledge. You need a lot of experience. You have a lot of uh, a historical background. You need a lot of theory. You cannot imagine when she goes on TV all the stupid stuff that she was talking about. The typical corporate talk that we're so great we're doing great all this kind of stuff the typical corporate talk but in the end you know if somebody really knows and understand you you know you can get to see how her bank is going slowly but steadily back she was talking about how fast their growth was well, wait a minute we know from history that 
every time financial institution grows too fast, usually it ends up in bankruptcy, usually it ends up being bailed out. Usually it has been mismanaged, number one. Usually it always, I mean, you gotta understand there are 35 banks which viciously compete. And they're all growing at 30% annually. If her bank is growing at 60, something's gotta be wrong. Well, we all know what's typically wrong, one of two things. But the biggest one is they take undue risk. They provide extra risky loans. That's the one way to do it. The other way to do it is they offer higher interest rates on the liabilities, lower interest rates on their loans, and they have thinner margins, profit margins. And when you have a thinner profit margin, usually a little bit of losses wipe out the profit margins and swing you into losses. And from there to bankruptcy, it's a very short step. All you need is a little bit of a rumor that the bank is in trouble. All right? So, well, now, it's, it's actually very interesting, I just read the news uh, two days ago, is that this particular bank was, uh, was downgraded by Moody's to junk status. Again, in other words, it was no good anymore, so they were warning this and one other bank by Moody's. But, but the point is that, uh, again, experience in running a bank is not, this is not changing tires for cars. This go, is not cooking. When you go into the bank, they give you a lot of training. It's not only experience. Yes, training but that's where the, the yes, they provide you the training, but this, again, is not changing tires, and this is not cooking job. This is not a cleaning job where you get a little bit trained. You need five or eight years of solid, rigorous. I mean, you're getting two years of MBA degree, and how well are you prepared to run the whole bank? And to be aware of all the risks. Usually, you see what's going on, you listen to five or six people, but you don't have the historical background, you don't have the theoretical background. It takes an awful lot. I mean, you gotta understand the books only on risk management are that big. Just figure out. You got well over 100 different risks. You gotta understand risks morph into each other. One risk transforms into a second, a second transforms into a third. You try to manage one risk and in the process of managing you create another bigger risk, then you start managing the second risk, you create the third risk, you know, interest rate risk morphs into, let's say, uh, credit risk, credit risk, then morphs into currency risk, currency risk morphs into, you know, and I would risk morph into one another, you really need to understand all of this. Usually, even, even though everything, yeah. is, everything in, in our education is uh, made on assumptions, and all of that at the end collapses. Even if you're educated and you're not, if you're not educated, it's the same. Uh, well, it's not and the same. And one of the greatest banks, uh, yeah. all of the greatest banks, or the greatest Yeah, all of the greatest banks go down. Okay. So it, well, but Okay, but the answer is they're not the greatest. That's the big mistake. But they, they, but they were educated. Yes, but they were the problems. They were education? No, 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 it's not only education. Okay, so one of the reasons, let's call it, let's clarify. They got too big. So the process is, they were the biggest in the world because they grew too big. Once they grew too big, the second reason is they grew too complex. CEOs of these banks had no idea what the bank was. CFOs had no idea. Chief financial officers had no idea what but was they going came on. With a degree. Yeah, they came with a degree. That's what I'm saying. This is exactly what I'm explaining. I'm explaining that these people have extraordinary degrees with an extraordinary education and they have hard times running a major financial institution. It's not because of that, it's because of the global competition. Well, look, look, look but this is irrelevant. I'm making a very simple argument. You have extremely sophisticated managers with 40 years of experience and all the great education and they miserably fail at managing a bank. And you'd expect the lady with little or no education that started as a cashier and worked her way up to run the bank. That's the point. The point is the most sophisticated miserably fail 
and you'd expect the cashier lady to do well? The answer is she can, no. She can learn. She doesn't have to have an education. She can read. <laughs> uh, look, when you're going through, again, we, we can keep arguing. You can, we can keep arguing, but uh, I'm just telling you what's the reality. And, you, and you're going, oh no, we let, we got to defend her. You know, she's a defenseless I'm lady. I'm not defending her. Yeah. I'm, def I'm not defending her, but I'm saying even if you're educated, everything could, could come. Correct, correct. It will collapse. Well, no, we know it does collapse. It does collapse sometimes because education was not enough. Sometimes because complexity outgrew their education. Another reason is, which is the most common amongst bankers, is greed. They get too greedy. They get too greedy. Another reason is that greed always goes hand in hand with corruption. In other words, the system becomes powerless to self-guide because those who run it are too greedy and those who regulate it are too corrupt. So the system suddenly becomes corrupt. All right. Then the next thing is the culture we're talking about the corporate culture running the business or the whole industry becomes too corrupt. And of course the complexity. Again, it's very easy to blame international you know, growth and internationalization. This is true, but the reason is that complexity. Now another reason which is extremely common for uh, is called complacency. Complacency simply means that they feel overly confident that they can handle anything that comes at them. They feel that they're too smart, if not the smartest people on earth, and that they can handle anything. They also have overconfidence in the central bank. They have overconfidence in the regulator. They have overconfidence in a whole bunch of other things. All right, which is very common. So yes, there are processes which work against even the best managers in the world. And if you started as a ca cashier without the education, you are at a great disadvantage. You are at a great disadvantage. Well, this is what this is all about. Many of them are not truly, genuinely competent. It, that, that, that's how it works. And I'm not saying anything with people who have other degree. I'm just saying, this is what the reality is. Someone has a philosophy degree, all right? So these are the type of people. You mean yani, someone who has, like, for example, a PhD in, uh, yani, from when he was, and he's in his chemistry? Okay. Yes. You it, think he would manage the, the bank really efficiently and. No, 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 no. No, not necessarily. Right? No, not necessarily. Not right. necessarily. In other words, they don't have a heavy duty specialization in finance. They don't have, yes, they, yeah, they have a PhD in, let's say, philosophy. They have a PhD in history. They have a PhD in chemistry, PhD in physics. Doesn't mean they will run the institution well. Actually, very most likely they will run it in a highly mechanistic manner where they will try to devise and follow simple rules and no matter what the rules are, the market will work around the way your rules unless your business is fundamentally sound. But the problem is that greed and complacency. For example, Bulgaria follows the footsteps of Iceland. We are getting these huge foreign loans which are in, denominated in a foreign currency in Euro and all bankers in Bulgaria are perfectly complacent saying well we are in a currency board of course just like Saudi Arabia but the difference is that we are running huge current account deficits we are running huge foreign borrowing so when the foreign borrowing meaning foreigners stop us lending the whole banking monetary system collapses it is unlike the currency board of Saudi Arabia in China where you have excess reserves and little debt. We have the opposite, we have little reserves and a lot of foreign debt. So usually now our bankers are extremely complex. Oh, they say the currency board is rock solid. It's perfectly stable. There are no risks whatsoever with currency. So what everybody does is take huge currency risk. 
they first borrow in foreign currency and second they lend in foreign currency so they transfer a big chunk of the risk to the retail guy who is not really sophisticated and didn't understand that if the local currency collapses the borrower blows up and then of course in a chain reaction the bank blows up well now we know that most of the Polish banking system is blowing up because of a currency risk because they all borrowed in cheap Swiss francs and now that the Polish lot has collapsed 20-30% suddenly the whole Polish banking system is blowing up as we speak alright, I mean that's what I read last week Hungarians borrowed in again foreign currencies mostly Euro and Swiss franc now the Hungarian foreign collapse and the Hungarian banking system is collapsing well this is exactly how Iceland blew up and went bankrupt they borrowed in all sorts of foreign currencies and everything was fine until the currency was stable once the currency was destabilized both the banking and the monetary system blew up uh, of course the same happened in the Asian crisis with Thailand all right with all the Asian countries they had these big but the point is you get this phenomenal complacency where people with little or no education believe that if something was going on for four, five, six or seven years it will go on like this forever all right and history never works like this things never go forever if you start doing unsound business practices sooner or later they will blow up in your face sometimes later but they certainly will blow up I mean, these are elementary lessons I'm going to be talking about the SNL crisis soon all right so management this is what they want to check earnings, earnings is the next one uh, earnings well are they profitable or not it's a very simple question if they are making money hopefully everything is okay so uh, earnings is associated with profitability uh, if earnings are negative or the company is not profitable you gotta start looking seriously what is going on so if if they aren't making good earnings you gotta look and identify what is the root cause of the problem was it bad lending was it bad management was it too much risk was it you know there's got to be some problem you got to investigate you got to start digging deep and finally is liquidity and each of these it has an extensive procedure for going through well now a lot of Bulgarian banks are going through uh, or using very very similar so this procedure procedure has become to a great degree an international standard in the industry and that's why I'm uh, teaching you not because this is what the US regulator is using because this is the law but because this has become international practice throughout the whole global financial community we use very similar procedure in Bulgaria Basel II uh, suggests very similar procedure it's actually uh, its origins are coming from Basel II regulations which most countries in the world have adopted you probably here in Saudi Arabia have a very very similar procedure to the camel it may be a little variation one or another variation but it has become a fairly standard this is considered to be comprehensive in other words if you work out the details of these you're not likely to be missing any major pieces of the puzzle all right so this is essentially a procedure to provide a detailed financial analysis of a financial institution so for corporates for corporations they have a different type of financial ratio analysis so this is one of the basic analysis for what we call soundness sound a business is sound if it can be sustained in the long run and it uses good business practices all right so that's why we call it sound banking well in Bulgaria 
for seven or eight years, banking system was growing at 50% on very unsound basis. But every day they come and say, Bulgarian banking system is sound, it is stable, we've got no problems, we're good, we're using European methods, we're using international standards and whatnot. Well, uh, now what we know is that the uh, Spanish banking system has already blown up completely, so apparently the European standards weren't good enough. We already know that the Irish banking system has already completely blown up. So, they're in big trouble. We, now we know that uh, Italian banks are mostly uh, you know, in deep trouble. Why? Because they lent to Eastern European countries like Bulgaria, Romania and whatnot. So, they're in deep trouble. Uh, we now know that Swedish banks are almost bankrupt because they lent to the Baltic countries. Yeah, Estonia, Latvia, you know, Litva. So, they lent to those countries and those three countries say, we are great and rock solid because we're using the Swedish banking model, which is rock solid. All right, the Riksbank is the first central bank from 300 years. All right. Well, but what we know is that it's been blown up, you know, over 10 times in history. So every 20, 30 years, the system blows up and then starts all over again. You know, they had a crisis just 20 years ago, and every time they always say the same. Oh, we have learned from the last crisis and we won't repeat it. Like the SNL crisis. The SNL crisis was based on a real estate mortgages and poor real estate lending and everything. And everyone was saying we learned how to manage mortgage loans and real estate loans in the real estate mortgage industry. And guess what? 20 years later, the US American system is blowing up and taking down most of the global financial system with it. All right? So, liquidity. Let's see what's next. You want to take a break or you want to continue? Break. All right, break. Okay, break. To do.